3D graphics are integral to augmented reality, but it's an area lots of people struggle with. Maybe you're a beginner feeling overwhelmed with all the terminology, or maybe you're an experienced artist struggling to work within the limitations of AR. If that sounds like you, this video is for you. Now, this is not a Blender tutorial. It's not a 3D modeling or texturing tutorial. This is a guide on how to get your 3D models into Lens Studio, Metaspark, or Effect House for your Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok filters. If you're a beginner, we'll be going over all the different kinds of concepts you need to learn more about. This video will serve as a starting point for you to continue learning. I'll explain the concepts and then you can go on and on your own look up tutorials for your 3D software of choice. If you're an experienced 3D artist, this guide will also be helpful for you because it will help explain some of the limitations of AR, things to look out for, and maybe changes that you need to make to your workflow. If you're coming from something like concept art or film or TV, there might be some pretty big changes. If you're a game developer, it's probably going to be very similar to what you're already doing. With that said, let's get started. All right, so I am using Blender for my 3D software, uh, but you can use whatever you want. Uh, so I'll be showing you what I'm doing in here, but remember this is not a Blender tutorial, so I'm not going to go into any great detail. Uh, this is just to show you more the 3D side of getting things into AR. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the 3D mesh itself. So here is this alien model. It's not something I made. It's something that I got off the internet. And it is, if we go into edit mode, we can see it consists of these different shapes, polygons. And most of these are quadrilateral because they have four sides, four vertices. Uh, but here and there, you might have different shapes. And in your models, you may have different shapes as well. Now, the actual shape doesn't matter too much as long as they all end up as triangles. All the AR software, Lin Studio, Metaspark, and Effect House um, refer to triangles for the poly counts, and some of them require triangles. Um, I believe Effect House might be dealing with that hard requirement, um, but just uh, make sure that you can export everything with triangles. Now here in Blender, you can see these are all quads. When I export, everything gets triangulated and it imports fine into the 3D software. So don't feel like you need to manually go in and make the triangles. Just keep in mind that's how um, the software is going to be referring to these different models. All right, so the main thing to keep in mind is the triangle count here. So in Blender, I can turn on the statistics to take a look and we're at 19,388 triangles. And that is great for our AR software. Uh, so they all have different limits. Lin Studio can go up to 100,000 triangles. Um, if it's rigged, they recommend 60,000. Um, and Effect House and Metaspark uh, have a little lower limits. Meta is at 50,000. And then Effect House wants 60,000 total in your filter and 20,000 per model. So right here, this 19,000 triangles, we're kind of at the limit of what Effect House would like. Uh, so each software has different requirements. Um, but overall, try to keep it as low poly as possible. Remember, these are running on phones. Maybe you have like the iPhone 14 Pro Max, but someone using your filter lens is probably going to be running a lower end device. And so the more lightweight your model, the better it's going to function. All right, and so another helpful tool while modeling are modifiers. Uh, they're probably named something else in other software. Uh, so here, in Blender, often we add the subdivision surface just to kind of make things smoother. So this is already a pretty smooth model, so we won't really see a difference. But you can see my triangles are now at 77,000. And if I bump this level up, now I'm at 300,000. So keep an eye on that. Um, how smooth do you need your model? And what can you get away with? Uh, so this one here, I'd already applied the subdivision surface modifier. So it's plenty smooth enough so I can go ahead and remove that. Now, there are lenses that you can create that kind of follow a user's facial expressions. Um, I'm not going to make one here, but there's a very important tip I want to share. Uh, so we create those by creating uh, these shape keys. They might be called morph targets or blend shapes, um, but it's basically the shape keys. So how that works is you create it. It creates like a basis. So this is your neutral expression. And so let's go ahead and create one for our right eyebrow up. Now, keep in mind that these names might be important. So check your software. Otherwise, you're going to have to remap the names. 
Um, but how this works is we can now, I'm gonna set this to a value of one, go into edit mode. I'm gonna select kind of these vertices here and I'm going to move them up a bit. So this isn't what we'd actually want in our final ones, but let's just for a demonstration. So we have that. And now as I move this, the eyebrow moves. And this is how you make your models follow facial expressions. Now, if you have a subdivision surface modifier, uh, you cannot export those blend shapes. Uh, so make sure that you have applied your modifier first. Now, if I come in here and I want to apply it, we're gonna get a message about the modifier can't be applied to mesh with shape keys. So this is a gotcha for people creating those types of lenses. So if I want my alien to match my facial expressions, I need to apply this modifier before I create my shape keys or else I just lose it. So that is a limitation of the 3D software, not the AR sides, but you don't wanna make like your 50 shape keys for full facial expressions and then find that out. Uh, just something to keep in mind with your modifiers. Uh, it's nice to have them because you can kind of make changes non-destructively in a sense, but at some point you might want to apply them just to make sure you don't run into problems down the road. All right, so we have our model, and if we are to export it, the main formats we want to use are FBX and OBJ. So here's FBX, here's OBJ. Now the main difference is OBJ will only export your um, mesh and the um, materials. If you have an animation, you have to use FBX. The OBJ format does not include those, so go with FBX. Now you can also use a GLTF or GLB that works with, um, I think all three platforms, uh, Lin Studio, MetaSpark and Effect House. I usually just stick with FBX though. All right, now if you have a 3D character, you don't want them just static, you want them animated. So here I just grabbed an animation from Mixamo. I use that to both rig my character and animate it. I'm not gonna go over that process here. I do have a separate tutorial if you're interested but I have here my alien dancing and this gray thing that's appeared, that is the rig um, or armature. And these individual parts are the bones. So I'll pause it and let's hide the alien to take a look. You can see we have like a spine, we got the legs. If we look at the hands, we got fingers. And so you can import animated meshes onto all three platforms, but there are a few things you need to keep in mind. All right, so the first thing is frame rate. Both Lin Studio and Effect House recommend 30 frames per second. Metaspark, for whatever reason, recommends 24 frames per second. Uh, so you can change that if you want. I've done it without changing it. Um, that's just the recommendation. Another thing to keep in mind is Effect House has a hard limit of 50 bones per um, rig. So you see here we have our stats for kind of triangle count, but nothing about bones. So at least in Blender, I'm gonna select my armature, go into edit mode, and now you can see my bone counts. And I'm at 57 bones. So as is, I cannot import this into Effect House. So what you need to do is, um, if you're using Mixmo, you might need to delete some bones. If you're making your rig, you need to keep that limit in mind. Uh, so here we have this bone top end, or I guess head's top end bone. Um, I can just delete that bone. It doesn't seem to do anything. And then maybe I can come in and delete some of the fingertips. And also while you're rigging, just decide, do you actually need those, all the fingers or not? Uh, but here we are, now we're at 48 bones. We're below that limit. So I can exit that mode and let's bring our character back. And you can see the animation is still working fine without those extra bones. Um, if you're an animator, those might be helpful for you, but as far as importing it, now that's animated, I don't need those bones, I can delete those ones. All right, so another thing to keep in mind is how many bones can influence a particular vertex. So if I take a look at my model, each of these little dots, these are called vertices, uh, singulars vertex, and those are influenced by the bones. The bones dictate how this model moves. So if I go into my weight paint, I can see these vertex groups and these map the vertices to the bones. And here their names the same as the bones. So if I select the Mixmo rig head vertex group, 
these are all the vertices that are influenced by that head bone. So blue means zero influence, red means uh, essentially total influence, and then you have this kind of this intermediate scale. So you can see the head up here is fully influenced by the head bone, uh, the chin less so, and then the neck is a little influenced as well. So I can select the neck, you can see where the neck influences. So as a general rule, uh, you want no more than four bones per vertex. So what does that mean? So here we have my head bone. You can see its influence extends to the neck. We have the neck has some influence here. And then we come to spine two and that moves down. So these vertices here in the middle of the neck are currently influenced by two bones, the head and the neck. And that is fine. So both the head and neck bones can influence these vertices. Now, if we were to uh, kind of adjust these, maybe we want to move the spine influence up that's gonna be three bones influencing the neck. And that's fine. You can go up to four. Uh, so that means is you could have four bones influencing these vertices. Um, that's really repetitive. But this is something, it is important. It's not gonna keep you from importing your models, but it is gonna change your animation when it's imported potentially. Now, if we come in and look here, there might be some vertices here that are influenced by three bones but you can see it's really light blue, so it's a small influence. Now, when you import your model, it's going to just keep four bones to influence a vertex. Uh, so you might be lucky and it might be these small influences that get dropped, but it's something you need to keep in mind because we wouldn't want our head influence to be dropped if there are say five bones total influencing the head. So this rigging, uh, this weighting was done by Mixamo but you might want to come in and kind of adjust this. Maybe you want to make the influence stronger down here, maybe subtract it off the neck. Uh, so just keep in mind, even if you use an automated tool, you might need to do some cleanup to keep your animation looking good on each of the three platforms. And the last step here is if I select the rig, I can see these keyframes here and I can go to the end and I can see that they uh, extend out a little more than I have here. So looks like they go up to frame 763. So I just want to change this end here. So when I export my model, I'll make sure the entire animation exports. Oh, looks like 762, there we go. And so, yeah, just make sure that range is correct when you export. And then if it's like a dancing character or something, try to have your animation loop. You don't want like a hard transition. So you can see here, if we start at the end, it kind of comes around, kind of goes to rest pose and then picks right up, it's nice and smooth. So try to keep your animations looping if possible. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears and switch to a different model so that we can talk about the UV map. Now, what is a UV map? So we have our 3D model. It's in three-dimensional space, but if we wanna put an image on it, images are in two-dimensional space. Uh, so how do we make that match up? That is where the UV map comes into play. So I have my model here. And in Blender, I'm gonna to go to this UV editing. And if I select all my faces of the model, you can see that you can see different pieces here. Now, what we've done is we've UV unwrapped our model. And what that means is we're going to decide how we convert our model into a flat um, plane, basically. So looking at my model here, you can see we have some lines. We have a line kind of coming along this edge of the hat. We have some here, and these are creases, or seams, I should say. Uh, these seams dictate where we can split the model. So here, you have a couple triangles here, and so you can see we have these triangular shapes here. And we have multiple because we can rotate our model. And if we come over here, uh, let's hide this head. You can see that we kind of have triangles on the other side because I have this seam running along the edge of the hat because uh, I gave it a little bit of volume, I gave it thickness. Uh, so that is that. So you can either do this manually, that's what I did here, I kind of chose where to place my seams and then I unwrapped it. Uh, if we switch to this bandana, you can see that this is a simple shape, easy to unwrap, and that this portion is here. Uh, so sometimes you have a simple shape like that. If you don't want to manually unwrap it, um, Blender has a smart UV project. Um, your software might have something as well. 
which will just kind of try to minimize my stretching and just lay everything out. So you don't pick where the lines are. Uh, the benefit to that is it's nice and automated. And if you're just kind of painting on, those seams don't matter as much. But the benefit to this method is if you need to open your textures in Photoshop, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. You don't have that big mess to navigate. Uh, so either way, you need a UV map to get a texture onto your model. Now, we are limited to just this single tile. Uh, you might be used to UDIM mapping where you can have multiple tiles. So you just kind of extend this out. So you'd have a separate space here with a different image um, in both the horizontal and vertical directions. That's a good way to get like lots of detail on your model, but you can't do that with Lin Studio, Metaspark, or Effect House. You have just a single UV tile. Now you can have multiple UV maps. Um, sometimes you might need that for a different texturing, like maybe something needs to be tiled, something doesn't. But you do need to keep everything in this single uh, UV space. If you need to have high resolution textures, um, you can overlap repetitive parts, um, you can use tiling images, etc. But this is a very important limitation that you have, just this single UV tile. All right, so we have our model, we have our UV map. Now we can add a texture to it. Now there are a few different ways we can do this. Um, but we first need to start by adding a material. So you can either add that in your AR software, or if you're creating your texture, you're probably going to want to create it in your 3D software. So here's just a material and we can adjust like the color. So we can make a black pirate hat, um, but that's not very interesting. You could do that, but it's kind of plain looking. So what you might actually want to do is use an image texture. So I have my textures here. Let me pull in my textures and we'll just put this color here. So this is an image texture I created in Substance Painter. And so you can see we have kind of a skull and crossbones and we have some nice texturing going on here. So we started in our air software. This is just kind of preview the textures and explain what's going on. Uh, so we have our diffuse texture here and that's just the color. And that is one of our main texture types. So we hop over to this UV editing. Now you can see how our pirate hat lines up with that texture. So we can zoom in, we can see our skull and crossbones here that shows up on the front. And then the rest is kind of lined up on kind of that black, gray, brown model texture. So that's why we need the UV map so that our image can map onto our model here. So if we go back out of edit modes, let's turn on the texture, you can see how it lines up. All right, so let's talk about texture types. So all three platforms use more or less the same workflow. It's this metalness roughness workflow um, with some channel packing. So we're gonna look at metalness roughness, we understand what the maps are, and then we'll talk about the channel packing. So I'm here on CG Bookcase. They have a bunch of great free textures and we can take a look at the different maps. So what we can use in our software is the base color or diffuse or sometimes known as albedo. This is just the color of an object. We also have the ambient occlusion, which kind of defines what parts of your model are in shadow. So that can help with the lighting. So my pirate hats on this outside, we aren't gonna have much ambient occlusion, but if we look inside here, this part here is gonna be in shadow and much more than this outside part. So our ambient occlusion map would have some dark in here and then light out here. And then here you can see that we also have it for like that um, metal. Now the height maps we don't really use, so you can ignore that. Uh, you can use it to create a normal map if you don't have one, um, but it's not something we can directly import really. Now we have this metallic map, which is going to dictate how metallic parts of your surface are. So we come in the blender, let's come to our Hat, we have this metallic slider, so we can make our hats uh, metallic, which if you're metallic, you're basically gonna be all reflective. And then we can adjust the roughness, which we'll get in a second, for how kind of glossy you are. And that is a different map. So these maps, the ambient occlusion, metallic and roughness are grayscale. Black is a value of zero, 
y is value of one. So it's kind of the scale. Are we very metallic or not metallic? And then the roughness is how rough or diffuse are we, which is high roughness. As you can see, we have a much more matte looking thing, even though it's all metallic. If we take this down, now we're purely reflective because we're very smooth. And that also works even if you are not metallic, that same roughness stuff. And then our last map is the normal map. So if we remember from our model, we have these polygon counts, but if we want lots of detail, how do we do that? Well, we use a normal map. So here, let's turn off this stuff. Let's bring in our normal map. There we go, let's get the right nodes. And if we plug this into the normal, this is gonna create the illusion of detail. The normal map is telling whatever is rendering this, which direction the light should bounce. So you can see here, we have a bunch more texture here. If we turn this down to zero, you can see it's nice and smooth again. If we turn this up to one or increase strength. You can see it looks bumpy. We aren't actually making this bumpy. This is just the normal map is telling the light that the light should bounce this way. So our hat is still nice and smooth, but it looks like it has some texture. And normal maps are a great way to make things feel more real. So you can see just adding that already makes her hat look a lot better, um, a lot more worn, looks, well, looks leathery, looks like a hat. All right, so those are our maps. Now, what is this channel packing? So images come in red, green, and blue channels, and our ambient occlusion, metallic, and roughness are essentially single channels, they're black and white. So instead of having to import three separate images, we can pack them into a single image. We get three images in one, and that's this ORM texture here. All right, so the ORM texture here is O for occlusion, R for roughness, M for metallic. So if we are using um, this ORM pattern, this is going to be our ambient occlusion on the red channel, roughness on the green, and metallic on the blue. And this is the pattern that Metaspark uses. So we could directly download this image and import it into Metaspark, as we'll see in a little bit, to get these three maps all added. Now, Lens Studio calls this material params. Effect House calls it MRAO, but they follow a different pattern. They put metallic on red, roughness on green, and ambient occlusion on blue. So there's another little difference between the three. If you are using Substance Painter, there are presets for Lens Studio and Metaspark in there to directly export these um, channel packed images. If you use different software, maybe you baked textures or you download something from like CG Bookcase, there is a really handy site that will pack these for you. So I'll have the link in the description, but there's this site that somebody made, but you just drag your red channel here, the green one, blue one, and it will create an image. You can download that and you have your channel packed image. Uh, so once we jump into the AR software, we'll see how that kind of enhances our models. But if you need an easy way to channel pack, I recommend this site. All right, so one map you might have noticed is missing from here is opacity. Now my pirate hat model, there's no transparency here, but you can see we have alpha sliders. Um, I don't have the blend mode right here, but you can have transparent parts, maybe have like a lacy veil or something. Uh, so how do you do that in your AR software? Uh, Lens Studio has a dedicated opacity channel you can import an image in. It would also be black and white white being visible, black being transparent, or you can just use a PNG image. Um, we can either use JPEGs or PNGs. If you use a PNG, you can just have your transparency in there. And one last note about the textures is the resolution. Lin Studio can do no more than 2K, which is 2048 on each side. Metaspark and Effect House are limited to 1K textures. So that's 1024 pixels on the side. That is not a ton. But remember that people are using these filters on a smartphone, on a small screen. It's not outputting in 4K. So you can get away with a lot lower, lower resolution than you might think. Uh, so you might work really hard on this 4K texture, might look amazing. But remember, you're stuck to 2K or 1K resolution depending on the platform. All right, so I said that texture resolution was the last thing about textures, but I was lying. Uh, the other one is image size. Um, lens Studio, you can make lenses up to eight megabytes in size. 
Effect House limits you to five megabytes, and MedSpark is four megabytes. And Effect House also has a one megabyte limit on an individual image. So if you have um, lots of images, you can easily get um, too large of a file size. So I re recommend you use Crush E, or you can use whatever you want. So what does this do? Uh, this compresses your images and makes them smaller um, without necessarily scaling them down. Um, I like this tool. There are other tools out there. A Lens Studio and MedSpark have built-in image compression. Um, they don't give you too much control and they're slow. So I just like to use this third-party tool before I import my images. So you just drag them in. You can adjust the quality and then you can just save the images. It's really easy to use. So try to optimize as much as you can before you get into AAR software. Um, you can resize, but don't bring like an eight megabyte PNG into Spark because you're gonna have issues. It can compress it, but you're still gonna have maybe file size issues. So do as much optimization as you can. Go with JPEGs, unless you really need that crisp detail or transparency. And then I know compression can degrade quality. There are trade-offs. Remember, it's on the phone screen. It's better to have a slightly degraded texture so your effects can be usable than not publish it at all. All right, so we finally have our 3D model ready, animated, we have the textures. Let's get it into uh, Lens Studio first. All right, so let's start with importing our pirate hat. So we do that in the resources panel. So you can click this plus button and do from files and find it, or you can just drag it in, which is what I'm going to do here. So I'm just going to find my file and drag it on over. So here's my FBX file. So there's gonna be this import options. You can pretty much just leave this uh, normal. You don't need to mess with us stuff unless you really want to, but by default, it's all gonna work fine. So there we go, there is our pirate hat. So there's this little F icon thing. If we try to drag that in, it was going to create a scene object and um, nothing is quite happening. What we actually wanna do is open this up and find this one with the P and drag that in and we have our pirate hat. Uh, so let's go ahead and just move this down so we can see a little better and you can see this pink and black checkboard, and that means we didn't have the materials when we exported it. So just choose the mesh. So this P, this is like a prefab. This is like a grouping of stuff. These little blue box icons are the actual meshes. So select that, and you can choose a material. If you haven't created one, just come in here, and let's go with the Uber PBR. So that will create a few things over here. You'll see it working. And once it's done, it'll show up here, hit OK, and we have our material. So this is not what we want our hat to look like. So let's go ahead and pull in our textures, and then we can start working on getting them on our material. All right, so here are my textures. I have my base color or the diffuse material params, which is that channel packed texture, and then my normal map. So I'm going to select my material. Uh, I can close out this preview, and you can see we have a ton of options here. Uh, but fortunately, we don't need to change much. So our base color, make sure this is white. Sometimes with a model from Blender, it'll be like a light gray. So what this does basically is it'll tint everything. Uh, so if you go darker, it'll kind of fade out your material, make it all darker, or you can add a colored tint. Uh, just stick with white usually though. Uh, texture, I'm gonna click on this box and choose the base. And you can see we have this here. It's looking much better already. Uh, let's do our normal map. And if you don't have these options, you can just check the box. Like see here, opacity texture, if we had that, we could check the box. And now we can choose our image for it, but we don't have that. So here's our map. And then we have inside the lighting, we have metallic roughness, or we can just choose our material params texture. So let's choose that. And now you can see we have our pirate hat. Uh, so you can play with this roughness stuff with the material params and you can actually adjust it. Um, this is gonna basically be the strength of how this image is actually applying to it. Uh, so just keep those at one so your image takes over. And you can see here this mesh UV zero. If we had used a different UV map, we could choose that here, the UV one. Uh, but just keep those a default and we have our model with the textures inside Lens Studio. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and hide this pirate hat and I'm gonna bring in that alien so we can see how we get an animated model into here. 
So I'm going to drag my FPX file in. Let's import that. All right, so we've imported that and you can see down here in the logger, oh, I detached it, that's fun. So we'll just expand this. So you can see there are some messages, some messages about some stuff being renamed, that's fine. Um, you might see this, there are some vertices with more than four bones per vertex, it's a warning, blah, blah, blah. But it is all in here. So let's just close it out and we're gonna open this up grab the one with the P on the icon. Let's add it to our scene. All right, so you can see we got a much more stuff here. We got all the kind of rig here. This little purple film reel means there's an animation. So let's just close that. And there is a problem. We don't have our alien. We can see something there. So what we need to do is I'm gonna use my mouse reel to scroll and we can see our alien is giant. So you can resize in your 3D software or you can just choose this kind of root object. I'm gonna lock the scale. Let's just go 0 0.1, 0 0.1. That's much better. Actually, let's even go even smaller just so we can see it here. And let's move it down. And you can see our alien is dancing. So that worked out pretty automatically. Uh, so sometimes this might not work though. So what you need to do is select this um, Object, so I know this purple thing I said is an animation. You wanna select the little prefab here. So this has the animation mixer. So you wanna make sure that your frame range is correct. You got your frames per second. Uh, you got your weight, your speed. So the speed, we could do like two and we'll dance a little faster. Let's go 10 and dance super fast. So if your animation speed is wrong, you can mess with that. Let's go back to one. Um, but what's this weight thing? So here we have a clip. Sometimes you might have multiple clips. So if your animation looks really bad, you might need to disable other clips or you can select multiple clips and adjust this weight. So this clip has a weight of one. So this is fully playing. Uh, if you have other clips, you can set their weights to zero or just check the box to disable it. So I turn that off, our animation stops. If I set this weight to zero, it also stops. So just kind of check those out. This blend type is just how this animation kind of blends on top of other animations. Uh, but if you have a single animation, you should be okay. And then you can auto play, whatever. You can go to layer view. But yeah, clip view, just make sure you got your stuff playing and you should be good. Now you might see that our model here imported with some materials. So our pyre hat, you can see it doesn't have a material here. Our materials came in from Blender and you can adjust stuff here. You can change roughness. You can change the base color. You can add a normal map. You can add whatever you want to these materials. All right, now let's take a look at importing our models into MetaSpark. So we do that down here in the assets panel and we can click on this plus button go to import from computer, or we can also just drag things in again. So I'm going to dr bring in my pirate hat FBX. We'll copy that in. And so here we got our pirate hat, gave it a default material. And so I can't drag this into my scene. I'm gonna drag the pirate hat with this little cube icon. Let's just bring it in somewhere. Let's move it down so we can see it. And there is our pirate hat. So let's go ahead and bring in the textures and then we'll start uh, adding them to the material. All right, so here are my textures. So those will come in, create a new textures folder and Metaspark is gonna start compressing these automatically. Uh, so you can just let that do its thing. It takes a bit, but let's go and get started. So my pirate hat here, if I select it, I open it up. Here is that mesh and you can see we have this default material. So this is one we wanna work with. So I'm gonna choose that. And there are some different shader types. So flat is just like, there's no light being applied. Uh, standard will have some options here for different stuff. I'm gonna go with physically based so that we can use those um, metalness, roughness textures. So we got that. Let's change this base color to white. So we don't have any weird tinting. Now let's go and make this bigger so we can actually see our hat better. So our texture here, the albedo, that's our diffuse. 
So we can choose the default material color, and there's our hat there. We can choose our ORM texture for the occlusion, roughness, metallic. And we might want to bring these up to one. And then we can turn on our normal map and we can choose normal. And our hat is looking pretty good. So you can see we have kind of this metallic edge, it's glinty. We have that detail showing up. Uh, you might notice, you can kind of tell with this model that it's a 1K texture. You can kind of see some pixelization. Um, I could have done a better UV map to give a little more detail there. Um, but yeah, that's just one of the limitations. It's a 1K texture, uh, but overall it still looks pretty good. And if we want to light this a little better, um, Lens Studio has these default environment maps. But here in Spark, we can turn this on and we can search the AR library. And we can choose an environment texture. So let's just come in here and let's just pick a random one. Uh, let's just choose this sunny Vondel Park. Import free. And then that is going to light our model. So we might want to turn off this ambient light. We can turn off the direction light if we want. Now let's come back to material and the environment. Now we can kind of change the rotation. So you can see this is pretty drastic. We might not want this, um, but at least you can see how our map's working. You can see we got the bumps from the normal map, um, etc. So you can play around with which environment map you want. You're lighting, but basically this is how that material works. Uh, so we got our textures in the Metaspark. Let's bring in our animated model now. So here is that alien FBX file. I'll drag it over. And let's turn off the pirate hat, change the visibility. And let's bring in our alien. So you can see we have a few things here. We have the materials with it. We have this animation, but here is the model itself. You can see it is giant. We want to scale that. Let's go 0 0.05. 0 0.05. All right, so that might be a little small, but there you go, let's scale it up. So here we have our alien. Oh, we need to turn these lights on because that environment map isn't operating on it. All right, so there's our alien. It's not dancing, so what do we do? So let's select our model here. You can see we have this armature and we have our mesh. So our mesh has materials as the skeleton, armature, um, we can just add if we want. But what we want to do is select this one here and we have this animation slot here. So we can open this up. We need to create a new animation controller and now it will start playing. So if we look over here, we already have that like animation here, but we need this playback controller for it to actually play. And so if we select this, this is where we can have it. Do we want it to play? Do we want it to loop? We can change the speeds. We can trim the animation and we can choose what animation clip it uses. So in Lin Studio, we had those like different clips we could blend. Uh, in Metaspark, this is where we would select that. If we had like multiple animation layers, now, uh, these are going to just be called the animation clips. Uh, but yeah, there we go. So we have our model in here and animated. And last but not least, here we are in Effect House. So we also have an assets panel here. We can click the plus button, import from computer, or I'm just going to click and drag so I don't need to look through folders. So let's start with our pirate hat. Uh, so I'll bring in that FBX file. And it also has import options. Um, so you can import vertex color, blah, blah, blah. I'm just gonna hit imports. The defaults are generally fine. And we have this pirate hat folder and our pirate hat um, object here. And so I don't wanna grab just this part. I'm gonna grab this entire little cube icon here. Let's drag it in. So this is going to create our pirate hat. Let's move it down so we can see it. All right, so there's our hat. We open this up, you can see we have our hat solid. 
and this has this default material on it. So let's go into our materials. There's nothing there. What's going on with that? You just need to add your own material as far as I can tell. So let's add a material. Let's do a standard PBR. Uh, PBR is physically based rendering. This is gonna use those image maps. All right, so we have our new material added. I'm going to select this and it should show up over here. And now we can start uh, adding our textures. But actually before that, let's add that material to our hat. I'm gonna switch from the default. All the pop-ups are going off screen, but here's a standard PPR. And feel free to rename them if you want. Okay, so back to the material. Let's do our texture. And let's go ahead and import those textures, of course. So I'll drag these over here. All right, so I'm gonna click on this default texture box. And that will, I can close the built in, and there is my base texture. Let's go okay, and you can see it there. It might look a little fuzzy. Remember, Effect House is limited to 1K resolution. So we don't have no passing map, we do have a normal map. So let's enable that. Let's grab our normal texture. So that will give us uh, a little bit of bumpiness to our hats. And then let's go to the MRAO. Let's turn on the texture. And let's get our material params, which is named the same as what I had in Lens Studio. So that will give us our mellowness, roughness. Um, these sliders, we can also adjust. I'm just gonna bump them up to one so that it's basically multiplying this value by the ones in the image texture. Uh, so there we go, we have our pyre hat. So you can come in, you can take a look. 1K textures are a little fuzzy, but overall not too bad. Uh, now let's bring in our animated model. So I'm gonna drag this over to import it. So make sure you have your animation option checked. Let's import that alien model. Uh-oh, and I got this message about the bone count exceeding the size limit of 50. So let's go back to our model and take a look. Okay, so remember when I said to make sure that our bone count's under 50? I forgot to save that model, so I was importing it before I did that. So I just deleted those extra bones. So now we should be able to import it. All right, so it's importing. I'm getting this no such file directory for some something. All right, so coming back to our Alien and Blender, um, when we export as an FBX, we have this bake animation option. Generally, we want to keep that on, but if you look at the TikTok page on asset preparation and exporting from Blender, they deselect all of this, so that is what we're going to do here. Now, let's try importing this again into Effect House. Hooray, it worked. We have this little QB icon here. So let's hide our hat and let's see if we can get our alien up into there. So I'm gonna drag this little boxy thing here. And just like in our other software, let's change the scale. So let's go with a 0 0.1, 0 0.1 and 0.1. So it might be a little too big still, so let's move it back in the Z, move it down. And you can see our alien is just dancing on its own. No need to manually set the animation. But just so we know, if we open this up, here is our skeleton and render root, and you can see our animation playback is here. So we're gonna open that up. Uh, loop, there's just the one clip, and just the one animation. So not a ton of options. If we open this up, we get our armature, our objects, we can mess with the materials, etc. But that is that. That is how you import into Effect House. Uh, as we saw, it was a little pickier than Metaspark and Lens Studio. So make sure you refer to each platform's documentation pages uh, to make sure you follow their instructions. They don't all follow the exact same standard, unfortunately. But fortunately, they have pretty good instructions on how to import things. Now get out there and keep learning and creating, and I'm excited to see what you make.